my wife, Pastor Shelley, and I, we love being grandparents. Uh, it's uh, the joy of our lives. We have five grandkids. The oldest is eight, the youngest is one, and they bring a lot of life whenever they're in the place, too. Yesterday, we celebrated Easter early at our house because all of our family is in ministry, and so it was great just to, to be on our own schedule. We had the grandkids over, and there they are, the little cherubs, and we, we opened Easter, egg, Easter baskets. They, we had an egg hunt in the house. We had intended to do that outside, but it was raining, so we moved it indoors, and they were running through the house, finding, finding all the eggs. It was super fun. Well, we know that Easter dinner and eggs and candy and baskets, that's not the real meaning of Easter. But there are super fun ways to celebrate, sort of like how in the summer, going to a baseball game, lighting off fireworks, those are fun ways to celebrate Independence Day, but that's not the real meaning of Independence Day. Those are just fun ways to celebrate. So today, what are we celebrating? Jesus' resurrection. That's the real meaning of Easter, Jesus' resurrection. And who is Jesus? Well, he's God. And in, in the Bible, in, in Philippians 2, 7, it says, he gave up his divine privileges and was born as a human being. So imagine it. God puts on flesh and bones and comes and walks with us. And he taught us what it really means to love, to love each other, to love people, and to love God. Jesus healed the sick. He raised the dead. He cast out demons. He was tearing it up. And everywhere he went, he was blessing and helping and lifting up people. And then Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice for us. He allowed his body to be beaten so that you and I could be healed. It's the, it's the amazing irony. He never sinned, but he took our sins upon himself and he took them to the cross. He took the death penalty for our sins so that our sins could be forgiven. In another place in the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says Jesus was buried, he was laid in a tomb, and he was raised on the third day, a full bodily resurrection. His, his body that had been beaten and, and nailed to the cross was now healed and whole, and he was walking around, and he was saying things like, you got anything to eat? <laughs> and he was eating and being with people. Uh, so I'm going to just take uh, just a, a moment here and do something a little bit different. And we're celebrating the fact that everyone who puts their faith in Jesus receives eternal life. But I've got a fun little gift to give you. So ushers, would you come forward? And, and uh, we've got a little gift to introduce the next series of messages that starts next Sunday morning, all right? So uh, the next, next series is called No Greater Love. And I just want to invite you to come and be a part of it. Uh, I, I, every Sunday, we gather together as the church. It'll be a little different time, back to our regular time next week of 1030. But I want to invite you back. One of the coolest things that Jesus ever said is written down in the, in, in the Bible, in, in the book of John, chapter 15. And Jesus said, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And I always think about that on Easter. There's no greater love than to lay your life down for, for your friends. And that's what Jesus did for us. He laid his life down for us on the cross. So in this series, we're going to dig in to what it means to be loved by God, to be loved by Jesus. And I, I pray that you will, you will experience his love. In, in another place in the Bible, Ephesians 3, verse 18 and 19, it says, And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience, somebody say experience. experience. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. 
No greater love. So we're going to look at in this series, what does the love of a truly good father look like? Everybody had a different experience with their father. Some were absent, some were harsh, some were amazingly wonderful. But I want you to know that God is a good, good father. We're going to talk about what good fatherly love looks like in your life. We're also going to look at what happens to God's love for you when you do something unlovely or when I do something unlovely. We're going to be digging into this stuff in the series. So you, you've got this little heart popper. So when your heart is popping and you're starting to stress out, let that remind you that God has the greatest love possible for you. There's no greater love. And may it remind you, oh, no greater love. I got to get back to church this next Sunday morning and find out and understand and experience God's love for you. Okay, so that was just a little aside. Back to today's message. I want to ask you a question. Can Jesus' resurrection be scientifically proven or disproven? Can science prove Jesus' resurrection, that it really happened? Or can science disprove and say that it didn't really happen? Well, I read a quote by a, a, a scientist, Dr. Ian Hutchinson, from, he's an MIT professor of nuclear engineering, um, nuclear um, science and engineering. And he said, science offers natural explanations of natural events. But science has no power or need to assert that only natural events can happen. That's not what science is for. Science is to explain how natural events happen. Science is not even intended to explain how miracles happen. All right? So this, this uh, Dr. Hutchinson goes on to say, contrary to increasingly popular opinion, science is not, somebody say not, <laughs> science is not our only means for accessing truth. In the case of Jesus' resurrection, we must consider the historical evidence. Now, if you wanted to know if George Washington was real, science is not your game. Science is not going to prove or disprove whether George Washington was real. But there's a lot of historical evidence that would say, oh, yes, he's real. A lot of people saw him. There were paintings done of him. There were people wrote about him. Uh, we have things that, that he has done. There's historical evidence. And in the same way, there is historical evidence for Jesus' resurrection. And we're going to look at some of those today. Not all of them. There's too many proofs and evidences to, to cover in one day. But we're going to look at some of them. And one is the Christian message. Really, the, if you boil it down, the Christian message is that Jesus is God. He died to take the punishment for the sins of anyone who puts their faith in him. Three days later, he rose from the dead. And that he welcomes all who come to repent and believe. He welcomes them to live with him forever. That's the Christian message. If you just boil it right down, that is what being a Christian is about. And Jesus' resurrection is central to that message. It would be sort of like Disney's Frozen without Elsa. You got nothing. There's no story there. You just got some cold weather. And in the same way, Jesus' resurrection, that is the one key thing on which everything else hinges. It is the proof for all the other stuff that Jesus said and did. But a very good question would be to ask, well, couldn't Jesus' followers have just made the whole thing up? Couldn't they have made up the story of the resurrection? Well, they could have, but if they had, would they have been willing to suffer persecution? And many faced execution for a, for a story that they knew they had made up and was a lie? It's one thing to believe something and it's just a matter of faith. You might die for that. But we're saying if the disciples, if the followers of Jesus made up the story that he rose from the dead, would they have been willing to give their life for something they knew was a lie? For a lie that they made up? For 40 days after Jesus' resurrection, 
He ate with his fathers, with, with his followers. He talked with them. He encouraged them. And we know that Jesus occurred, uh, appeared to like one-on-one. -on -one. He uh, appeared to his 11 disciples. 11, sorry, <laughs> Judas. <laughs> um, he met with the 11. He, uh, one of the earliest church writers wrote just a few years after Jesus died and rose again that Jesus appeared to 500 of his followers at once. So can you imagine getting a group of 500 people together and saying, okay, everybody, we're going to make, we're going to fake a story here. Make sure you get all these details right and stick to these details. The, the impossibility of getting that many people to cooperate and get the story right and consistent, it's just, it's just another evidence. It's an evidence that the, the, the resurrection of Jesus really happened. 500 people saw him saw him, heard him talk in one setting after Jesus rose from the dead. That is amazing. So now, as Jesus began to meet with his followers, he encouraged them, talked with them, guided them. It, you can see a little bit of a, of a difference in his message to them and how he related to them. How, just how did Jesus relate to people after he rose from the dead? I'm going to look at a couple people in particular. One, his name was Peter. And I don't know if you've seen any episodes of The Chosen, but Peter is a very prominent guy, a very feisty guy that was a follower of Jesus. And he became part of Jesus' inner core. He, he was one of the, the three people that were closest to Jesus. But sadly, Peter abandoned Jesus in his greatest hour of need, when the angry mob came to, to, to arrest Jesus and take him away, Peter was there, and he went running the other way. And he, he, he uh, like held back, he followed from a distance, and he was outside uh, in the courtyard of the place where, where this mob was accusing Jesus and saying he needs to be crucified. And Peter three times lied and denied that he even knew Jesus. Okay, his closest friend in his greatest hour of need. And Peter said, no, I don't know him. He swore. He swore up and down. I do not even know that man. He said it in a way to distance himself because he was like, Jesus was caught. I don't want to get caught. I, I don't want to get beaten up or, or beaten or anything else like that. And just at that moment, there was one moment where Jesus looks out the window and Peter is looking in from a distance and their eyes meet and the rooster crowed. I don't have time to get into the whole story, but that was a big moment. And Peter just turned away and he ran away and wept and wept and wept. He felt defeated. He felt ashamed of himself. What have I done? I let Jesus down. Just when it needed me, I walked away. But after Jesus was crucified, he rose from the dead. He began to appear and meet with different groups of, of disciples. And Peter was there for some of those groups. But Jesus found a time when he could just talk to Peter by himself. Jesus had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with Jesus, with, with Peter. And I love what, what Jesus said to him. Peter was expecting that Jesus would turn his back on him. He's thinking, I abandoned Jesus. He has every right to abandon me. I turned my back on him. He could, it, would be, I would, it would be understandable if Jesus turned his back on me. But Jesus looks right at Peter and he says, Peter, I need you on my team. I need you to get back in the game and start to pastor my people. He said, be a shepherd of my people. Take care of them and continue my work. Wow, when Peter looked at himself, all he could see was a loser. When Jesus looked at Peter, all he could see was a leader. Jesus was closer than Peter thought. Even when Peter thought Jesus had probably walked away, Jesus was there. And Jesus is closer than you think. There's another person that was one of the closest followers of Jesus since the early days of Jesus, um, his ministry on earth. And her name was Mary Magdalene. 
And Mary uh, had followed Jesus. She had supported him. She had prayed for him. She had seen them, him do miracles. She was so close to Jesus. And she saw him die. She was there when, as watching him be crucified. Nothing she could do as the Roman guards made sure that he died on that cross. And a couple days later, she brings some burial spices to come and just to anoint Jesus' body. And she gets to the tomb, and it is empty. The stone is rolled away. The Roman guards who were guarding it, making sure that, that no uh, disciples came and just stole him away and said that he rose, the Roman guards were there, but all of a sudden they were gone. And Mary's like, where's Jesus? She's looking around everywhere. Where's Jesus? She's standing there by the empty tomb and weeping and weeping. She's feeling, her heart is breaking. And she, she's just distraught. Not only is Jesus dead, but his body is missing. What does this mean? And she looks up and she notices there's a person standing there she hadn't seen. And this, this tomb was in a beautiful garden setting. And she, she just thought in her mind, oh, that's probably the gardener standing there. And all of a sudden, she did not know this, but Jesus was closer than she thought. And Jesus is that man. And he turns to her and says, Mary. Whenever I read that story, that's how I, I hear it in my mind, Mary. But you know, they were friends. He probably said, hey, Mary, how are you doing? Hey, Mary, it's me. And all of a sudden, she realized Jesus is alive. His body was not missing. His body was resurrected. And he's right there talking to her. Mary looked at her life and she thought, it's over. What do I even have to live for now? Jesus looked at her life and said, it's just beginning, sis. Let's go. There's a whole big adventure of serving me ahead for you. I wonder what Jesus thinks about when he looks at you. You might look at yourself and see loser. Jesus looks at you and says, leader, overcomer, child I love. You might look at your life and only see the loss, only the bad things, only the stuff that you didn't want to turn out that way. And Jesus looks at your life and says, you know what, I can redeem that pain. I can take this thing out. In fact, I can even show you a way that that pain could be used for good in your life and in the lives of people around you. Jesus looks at your life and he sees something. I wonder what he, he is seeing as he looks at you right now. I know he's seeing some, something good. God has good plans for you. Jesus is closer than you think. And that's the good news. The good news, of course, Jesus rose again, but he didn't stay dead. He didn't stay there. He is right here with us, and he is closer than you think. Just because you can't see him doesn't mean he's not here. That's what Peter found out. That's what Mary Magdalene found out. Why does this matter so much? Because where Jesus comes in, he brings hope and life to hopeless situations. And I, I don't know what you're facing today. You may be facing something hopeless. I want you to know Jesus, when he comes in to your situation, he brings hope and life to hopeless situations. Maybe like Peter, you're feeling ashamed of something you've done or of many things you've done. Maybe you're feeling defeated because you just try, you keep trying to overcome and it's just not been working. It's not working. And maybe that's how you're feeling. Maybe you can relate to Peter. Or maybe you've experienced heartbreaking loss like Mary Magdalene. Maybe you've lost someone that you care about, a significant other, a family member. Maybe you've lost a job. Maybe, maybe you feel like you've lost your identity. And you're feeling lost. You're feeling the pain of it. And you wonder, how could Jesus ever Accept someone like you. How could Jesus ever bring hope to someone in your situation? Well, the good news is Jesus is closer than you think. And he brings hope and life to hopeless situations. Would you stand to your feet? I just want to pray for you right now. Go ahead and stand to your feet. Online, would you just get yourself in a prayer mode? Uh, I invite you just to, to bow your heads, close your eyes. You don't have to close your eyes to pray, but it does sometimes help to just shut out distractions around you. And I just want to ask you this morning, do you feel ashamed? Maybe you feel ashamed of a choice you made. Maybe you feel ashamed of something you've done or something you thought or said. Or do you feel defeated? 
Do you feel like, man, I just tried and tried. I'll never amount to anything. I'll never overcome this habit. I'll never, I'll never, I'll never. Do you feel shame or defeat? If so, I just want to pray for you. And that's it. I just want to encourage you. Would you just raise your hand like we've been doing earlier in this service when we have something to pray about? A lot of times we'll raise our hand to God. Online, you can raise your hand to God too. Excuse me, many hands going up in this room. One of the first, well, the first sin brought shame and we've been struggling with it ever since. But one thing that Jesus came to do was take away your shame. He came to give you victory instead of defeat. And so, Lord, I just want to lift up every person who's raising their hand. And my hand is up too. I feel shame for choices I've made. And, Lord, we just come to you right now together. We're just, we're coming to you together. We're praying to you. We're talking to you, Jesus. And I thank you that you came to take away shame. And that when you forgive us, we're forgiven. When you give us a fresh start, we have a fresh start. It's, it's all because of what you do for us. And so, Lord, I want to pray for every person who's feeling these uh, uh, feeling emotions of shame, feeling defeated. Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name that you would bring peace, that you would bring joy, that you would bring your love. Lord, you, you demonstrated how much you love us by dying on the cross. So I pray, Lord, you'd help us to feel that love that you've shown. And Lord, I pray right now that you would give us the ability to lift our head up, to look you in the eye and not be ashamed. Jesus, I pray that you would take defeat and swap it out for victory. The victory that you won for us when you rose from the dead. Thank you, Jesus. And if you are feeling loss, Maybe, maybe you've gone through a loss recently. Maybe it was a loss that happened a while back, but you just still feel it so much. I want to pray for you. If you're feeling a loss of any kind, would you just raise your hand? The others of you can put your hands down if you want or raise them again. I want to pray for you right now. Jesus, you see the many hands that are raised. And I know, Jesus, you know what it's like to experience loss. Thank you, Jesus, that you care. You lost your friends when they, when they arrested you. You laid down your life. You set aside your divine privileges. You lost so much for us. Father God, you gave up your son. You know what it feels like when a parent loses a child. One of the greatest losses. So Lord, you know our loss. Father, you know what it feels like. You cried. You wept. And so now I pray that, that you would come as the God of all comfort and comfort every person who's experiencing loss. Maybe it was recently, maybe it was a long time ago, but the pain is still there. And Jesus, I pray that you would, you would take the sting out. I pray, Lord, that you would walk with us through loss. I pray that you would bring something good out of it, that you would turn it around. And Lord, I, I even pray that you would give us a glimpse of what you're doing. Lord, that you would encourage each of us, Lord God, that you have not forgotten us, you've not left us alone. You are closer than we think. And Lord, that is a comfort in itself. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You can look up at me for a second. I don't know if you know this story, but Jesus when he was crucified, hung on that cross, there were two other people, two criminals, who were crucified at the same time. It, it was a way of Roman ex, the Roman Empire execution. And so these two criminals, though, were very different. Criminal number one was just angry. 
he was mad at himself for making the choices that would lead him to be hung on a cross and punished. He was mad at the Romans who were enforcing the law and, and imposed this brutal, brutal execution method. And he was mad at God. He blamed God for getting him to where he is right now. And so he lashed out at Jesus. He slung some verbal abuse. He mocked Jesus. He, he, he made fun of him. He's like, if you're so great, if you're God's son, why don't you get us all down from here? He turned his back on Jesus. And he was without Jesus for eternity. But the other criminal had a change of heart while he was up there. And he said to the first guy, hey, don't you even care about God at a time like this? You're being, you're, you're being sentenced to die. You are on death's door. Now is the time to, to turn to God, not spit in his face. He, he said, you and I, we deserve this punishment. We did, our sins put us here. But this man, Jesus, is innocent. And then that criminal said something unbelievable. He said, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Why is that so incredible? Other people actually had said that to him before, but now Jesus was on the cross. So this criminal saw beyond the moment, and he believed Jesus is God, and he, whatever happened here, he's going to keep living. And he, so he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom because I know you're coming into your kingdom. I want to be in it. That was amazing. Now Jesus answered him right then and there and said, today you'll be with me in paradise. He could have said, we thought, oh, go and do a bunch of good deeds. Uh, go to church for two years. Um, go help some orphans. And then you get to heaven. That's not what Jesus said. That faith that you just demonstrated by saying, remember me, Jesus, that was enough to save you. So Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now, it's very interesting. Jesus didn't say, today you'll go to heaven. That tends to be the kind of language that we say a lot. But if heaven is just some place that you may or may not get to go to someday, sort of like a vacation destination, then it wouldn't be very fair if the only people who get to go there are the people who put their faith in Jesus. That doesn't seem fair. That seems exclusive. But Jesus didn't say, you get to go to heaven. What did he say? Today you get to be with me. Before Jesus died, he said to one of his friends, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus Jesus is the destination, not heaven. But when you're with Jesus, that's heaven. So here's the thing. If you want Jesus now, then you get Jesus for eternity, forever. But if you don't want Jesus now, you don't get him forever. It's not an unfair thing because the choice is all yours. And the choice is yours right now. Do you want Jesus, not just now, but forever, or you, do you not want him now or forever? The choice is yours. How do you choose Jesus? How do you become a Christian? Simply, you turn away from your sin. We are all born sinners. You turn your life over to Jesus and you let him lead. I want to pray for you one more time. Would you put, put, bow your heads just one more time? And I want to ask you this. Do you want to become a Christian? Do you want to choose Jesus today? Do you want him now so you can have him forever? Or do you want to turn your back on him now and you don't get to be with him forever? The choice is simple, but it's major. And the choice is all yours. If today you would like to put your faith in Jesus, become his apprentice, become his follower, and find your sins are forgiven, and eternal life is yours, if you want that today, and you've not yet done that, 
would you raise your hand? Just like we've been doing all day. We're raising your hand when you want prayer. Online, I can't see you, but you could still raise your hand to God. And in the room, if you want Jesus now, and you want him forever, and you have not put your faith in him yet, would you raise your hand? I'm going to give you one more opportunity to choose Jesus. And when you choose him, he always says yes. I want to be with you too. Let's pray. Now, would you just pray after me online in the room? Would you just pray after me? And if you raised your hand or you kind of wish you had, if you want to choose Jesus today, would you pray this prayer out loud to Jesus? Church, let's help him out. Jesus, I invite you into my life. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and be your apprentice starting now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, we say welcome to the kingdom of God. Welcome. We've got a couple more things to do before we wrap up the service. Would you be seated for just a moment? And would you please take out your Connect card? Please take out your Connect card if you have not filled out. And I want to just ask you, Hope and Life Church, would you fill this out too? Would you fill this out too? This is our annual survey. And if you are newer with us, would you fill this out too? If you haven't filled it out yet, do it right now. You, now is your time. But I want to do a survey with you. Online, you can use your camera phone and scan the QR code, and it will take you right to the Connect card. You can do it online. So I want to ask you one question. Where's your faith at right now? Where's your faith at right now? And I'm going to give you four. It's a multiple choice survey. I'm going give to you, give you four options here. Online, once you get, go to that Connect card online, you can, you can actually type into the prayer request area. So just type it, type it in the prayer request area. That'll work just fine. So everybody, would you choose A, B, C, or D? A means you're already a follower or an apprentice of Jesus. You were before you came today. You've already got a church. You're already following Jesus. You already prayed the prayer that we just prayed at some previous time. A, already. B, you're beginning a new relationship with Jesus today. You're just starting. You're just, you just now prayed that prayer with me. And you, you are beginning a new life with Jesus today. You just said, I do want Jesus now and forever. C, I'm considering putting my faith in Jesus. Maybe I need more info. I'm, I'm just not sure. I'm ready for that commitment now. Considering, Mark C or D. I hope no one marks this, but if, if it's honest, then do. D means don't ever. I don't ever intend to put my faith in Jesus. I don't ever intend to follow him. And here's my promise to you. If you mark that, I will pray for you. Just that. I'll pray. I'll pray that God blesses you, that God um, helps you to find him. I'll pray for you. So everybody, would you mark A, B, C, or D? Just mark it, A, B, C, or D. And in a few moments, we'll collect those. And so I want to just give you one more bit of instruction. If you marked B or C, this is what I'm going to ask you to do. Give Jesus one year. Give Jesus one year. Just like Jaime and Sandra did a year ago on Easter, they said, okay, Jesus, we're giving ourselves to you. And they began to come and gather with us. I, I want to challenge you. If you marked B or C, give Jesus a year at Hope and Life. Come every Sunday and gather. Unless you're out of town, come every single Sunday and learn how to pray. Learn how to talk to Jesus. Learn how to encourage the people around you. Learn how to serve. Learn how to be a part of a community of faith. And here's a promise. A year from now, your life will be different. And in fact, I believe your life will be better. If you give Jesus a year at Hope and Life, your life is going to be better. So I want to invite you to do that, all right? And I, I, would you please just wrap up that Connect card as quickly as you can, f fill it out, and Pastor Christian will give us some instructions. Thanks, Pastor yep. Garen. What an encouraging message. We can find real hope and renewed life in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Well, we have some announcements we're going to show you. So watch the screen. Oh, wait.
Oh, that is right. Thank you. So if you are helping out with a thank you, this is why we need we need to support each other. Um, <laughs> if you if you are helping out at the carnival, um, while the while the at, once the um, blah, 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 once the video starts, you can just head on out and then start setting up so that everyone else can go after it's done. All right, let's show the video. Hi everyone, here's what's happening at Hope in Life Church. Next Sunday we have so many really exciting things happening. We're starting a new encouraging sermon series. It's going to be great. You don't want to miss it. Also, happening in the kids' church, we're going to be having a kids' ice cream Sunday party. We're so excited. We're going to be playing games. Of course, having ice cream with all the wonderful toppings that you could possibly think of and just having a wonderful time. So invite your friends and your family. Um, we're gonna have an awesome time in kids' church, but also we're gonna have a fun time in the adult service as well because we'll be announcing the winner of our guessing game contest from today. So following our second service today at our Easter carnival, you'll find a jar full of these small little Easter eggs. You fill out a card, give it your best guess how many eggs you think are in the jar. You will have the chance to win a $100 gift card to Big Air Trampoline which is this really cool family place that you can go. There's all tons of activities. So a $100 gift card to spend there for your family. So you don't want to miss out on that. Make sure you fill out a card today for your chance to win, and it will be announced next Sunday. Yeah, and then next Sunday evening, we also have our annual Youth Nerf War. It's going to be a lot of fun. Make sure you sign up on the app. It starts at 530. You can head down over the park, set up barricades, you know, bring your own Nerf gun. We're going to play different game types, you know, red versus blue, capture the flag, things like that. It's going to be a whole lot of fun, really exciting, great for ages 10 to 17. And then Sunday evening, we also have a new series starting in our Hope and Life groups. I've loved all the series that we've gone through. I've always learned so much. And more than that, it's a time that we can connect with one another. We get to be in God's word. We can pray over one another. So if you're not already a part of a group, I encourage you to sign up. It doesn't matter. You know, we've got kids groups. We've got youth group. We've got men and women. So it doesn't matter. Just sign up. Show up. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. Yeah. Also, just around the corner is Mother's Day coming up May 14th. Invite all your mom friends. We want to celebrate you. We'll have a small little gift for all of our moms, a photo booth that you can take cute little pictures with your family afterwards, and also we'll be having baby dedications. So if you're interested in that, you can sign up on the app. I love baby dedications here at our church. It's such a special time where we get to come around to family and just say, like, we're going to support you. We love your family and um, just be there for you guys. So if you're interested in that, sign up on the app and we'll see you guys next Sunday. Thank you, Virtual, Pastor Tori and Joseph. Aren't they awesome? We have such great kids pastors. They're over in the back, really just pouring out their hearts and teaching all of our kids just such great things. And their whole team is amazing. Such a blessing to our church. Well, um, as you can see, we've got a lot of exciting things happening. So we hope that you'll join us, especially next week. Come next, come next week for service, stay after, and then Sunday evenings, we've got the Nerf War, we've got a new Bible study starting, tons of cool things that you can be a part of, and we invite you to. Amen? All right. Well, this time the ushers are going to be coming down the aisle, and they're going to be collecting those Connect cards. So if you can just pass them down the aisle... And then we can just get them as they go past. That would be awesome. And if you are new to the faith, so if you raised your hand and you said, I want to follow Jesus today, or you have recently, we have a gift for you. So if you stop by the following Jesus table in the lobby, it's got a big black banner booth. We have a free book, a free course for you to take. It's basically seven steps on how to follow Jesus well. And we want to walk alongside you as you follow Jesus. And then also, um, we're going to be, because it rained today, I don't know if you noticed, we still want to have our inflatable. We, so we, we, we want that for the kids. So what we're going to do is we're going to move all of the chairs in here to the sides, and then we're going to set up the inflatable in here. Let's do it. Multi-purpose room, amen? So if, if, we, if we could have everyone's help just moving the chairs out of the way, we'll drag that inflatable in, and it'll be great for the kids. And then join us for the carnival right after service. And we'll see you next week at our normal service time of 10.30 a.m. All right, God bless.